Okay. Welcome. Welcome to you all. Ja, ein ganz herzliches Willkommen an Sie alle. Mein Name ist Imme Scholz und ich bin eine der beiden Co-Präsidentinnen der Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Here, especially our guests from Tanzania to our foundation and I want to thank you for making this dialogue happen. We were looking forward to it uh, for a long time. Now we have been preparing it. And uh, I myself had been part of the first, of one first step in Tanzania. And I'm very happy to join you uh, today. Uh, the content of today's forum uh, was inspired by the Marbach Schiller speech given in November last year by Abdul Razak Gurna, the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2021. In several of his novels, as you may know, Gurna describes the deep impact of German colonial rule in present day Tanzania on people's lives, then and in the present, in a fascinating literary way. And I really recommend uh, to read him. In his speech, he highlighted an asymmetry. German society has failed to develop and practice its own memory about its brutal colonial past in East Africa while in Tanzania the trauma of the relentless cruelty of German rule has been passed on from generation to generation through oral tradition and official historiography. As much as Gorna is rightfully pointing out this asymmetry, it seems that a new era might have started with state officials taking important steps recently. In November 2023, German President Frank-Walter Steinmeier visited Tanzania and requested forgiveness for German colonial crimes <coughs> at the Maji Maji War Memorial in Songea. Katja Koll, Minister of State at the German Foreign Office, visited the town of Moshi in Kilimanjaro region in March this year and asked for forgiveness at a memorial service for murdered resistance fighters. In the meantime, the foreign ministries of Germany and Tanzania have intensified conversations in order to come to terms with their entangled colonial history. And we will hear more about that on our last panel today. This forum today is one of the cornerstones in our foundation's efforts to enrich and strengthen the official state-to-state -state process by opening spaces for dialogue between the two nations. Building memory that lives on and becomes part of the German identity is a task that needs to be carried out by people. We believe that civil societies are a fundamental asset when building a new ethic for the relations between Tanzanians and Germans and make them work. In this forum, we are building on the important insights and personal connections generated by previous events in Tanzania with the significant involvement of Professor Valen Silayo from University of Dar es Salaam, to whom we are very grateful. Our regional office. <clears throat> our, so with your support, our regional office in Nairobi supported a round table of communities living in the Kilimanjaro region on colonial remembrance work in March 23. In October 23, we held a roundtable in Dar es Salaam, which proved to be highly informative and connecting. And I had the pleasure, as I said, to be part of this roundtable too. Many of the attendees today are our guests in this forum, as they followed our invitation to continue the discussion in Berlin. Thank you all for your valuable inputs that inform this forum. Some of you have also participated in another forum held in Johannesburg in November last year with a focus on spaces of memory. So you see it is quite an intense work with many faces and steps and perspectives. Having had the opportunity myself to visit Tanzania and personally hear from experts, activists, artists, scientists and descendants, it became obvious to me and I truly felt what Gona had mentioned in Marbach. In Tanzania, the memory is alive and the trauma is prevailing. 
I have mentioned this also when I spoke about this visit. I was very impressed by the participants in this forum in Tanzania being able to trace the history of German colonialism, of this relentless cruelty in their own families. And I don't think we can do that in Germany. So this, what I call a living memory, which is part of identity. In Germany, we are far, far from there. So revisiting the past is one issue of concern, but it's not the only one, neither for the country itself nor for its relations with Germany. Strengthening economic development, building infrastructure while adapting to climate change and overcoming devastating events such as the recent floods are imminent tasks. At the same time, however, there are many who remind us of the fact that the recognition of the past, of its effects on communities and families, the losses and injustices need to be dealt with in a forward-looking way. Their knowledge, efforts and activism is admirable. In Germany, we still have not seen a full acknowledgement of the relentless cruelty of German colonial rule. There are voices that have been asking for it and that are demanding a change since a long time. Activism has played a very important role in reminding us of the constant amnesia and activism has been trying to build bridges. Let us build on that when we truly try to open a new era to make it really happen and make it meaningful. I'm very much looking forward to today's discussions and I said, as I said, I hope that they will provide impetus for a new post-colonial ethics of relations between our two countries. I would like to express my gratitude to all of those who have contributed to this endeavor. In particular, I would like to extend my appreciation to our dialogue partners from Tanzania for undertaking the considerable journey to participate in this event. By doing so, you have afforded us the invaluable opportunity to hear your perspectives and reflect on the steps we can take together. And a big thanks also to Thomas Fuß, who inspired the foundation and worked with us on the idea for this forum. <clears throat> Thanks to the film team of An Empty Grave for the wonderful premiere night yesterday, which opened this forum. And we wish you a successful start in German cinemas. And I heard that the cinema was full, so this is very auspicious for a good start. <clears throat> and I would also like to thank the Africa team, guided by Kirsten Krampe and especially Maria Kind who has put all her energy into this project for months, as well as thanks to our colleagues Joachim Paul and Daki. Gal Galgo, where are you? Don't see you. There. <laughs> ah, yeah. From our Nairobi office. I hope we will experience a truly open and enriching dialogue, and you know this is in the hands of us all, and I'm looking forward to it. And now, uh, Dr. Valens, I would like to invite you to come to the stage because you are going to take over the first uh, forum. Thank you. I'm so excited, and they say you can have butterflies in the tummy, right? But for me, my butterflies are everywhere. <laughs> but um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ima. Thank you, colleagues, um, for the opportunity just to be here and to talk about what we call a uh, heritage, um, um, a shared heritage. I don't know whether it's shared or it's not shared, but the readiness to talk about it is just a step. So I, will work, I want to welcome you all to the first panel this morning where we want to discuss, uh, to focus on the communities, cities, regions, and nation, at national level and see how um, issues of colonial history and violences can, and consequences can be read and interpreted from 
at these different levels. With me today, um, we have um, uh, four panel members that will be discussing different um, issues and together with you. I would want to uh, welcome Dr. Nancy Rushora. Dr. Nancy Rushora um, is a lecturer. She's a lecturer at the University of Dar es Salaam, has researched extensively on the colonial memories, especially uh, the Maj Maj War in the southern part of Tanzania, has published extensively on the, on the topic that we are talking today, and especially the memory. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Nancy Rushora. Thank you very much. Um, with us again um, is Bernard Intohonde. Bernard Intohonde is a member at the Dar es Salaam um, Historical, called Dar es Salaam Center for Architectural Heritage. It's called Dutch. They take care of what we call the colonial heritage in Dar es Salaam. They um, give people tour and help people to understand the colonial heritage in Dar es Salaam and whether it can be preserved and, and, and the beauty about, about it. Dr. Antohondi, please take the floor. Thank you. On the panel again, we are graced to have um, Dr. Vicencia Schule. Dr. Vicencia Schule is a profound artist. You can see that. <laughs> a profound artist, an activist, and taking the issue of colonial memory to another level, please. Yes. And lastly, we will have um, a commentator who will comment about the discussion today. Uh, this Christina Mashimi. Christina Mashimi is a, uh, just completed a PhD, right? And it's been working into the um, the schools that they, they, how do you call it? I mean, they, um, this, the system in Dar es Salaam, I forgot about it, but I can, I can come back to it. But she's looking into uh, how the colonial memories can entangle with the, with the contemporary youth and everything in, in, in Dar es Salaam. Please, welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you again, uh, colleagues. Um, thank you very much for accepting to be part of this um, discussion this morning. Uh, we have had uh, several discussions, and today we are privileged to meet a uh, group of people that want to hear from us and discuss with us the issues of colonialism um, in, the, in the German colonialism in Tanzania and memories, anything that we can give and share with them. I take great honor to be with you and share with you whatever you want to share with us. And I once again welcome to this panel, to, to, to this, uh, this, panel this morning. Um, I sometimes wonder what do we mean by memories of German colonialism, whether in Tanzania or somewhere else, but for this specific case, uh, do we refer to the issues that we remember about what happened in the, during colonialism? Do we refer to uh, bad or good? What do we have to remember? What, what do we have to uh, think about it? Um, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Nancy. You have been um, working the issue of memory for quite a while, a very long time. And you have been dealing with different groups uh, in trying to address the issue of memory. Could you share with us a little bit um, by whom, for example, and where 
and what forms is anti-colonial resistance, especially in connections with the Majmaj war, is remembered in Tanzania today. Thank you for, for the question, and thank you everyone for attending uh, this dialogue today. I'm delighted to be here and to be able to share uh, what I do in Tanzania. It's not often that we get this opportunity. And for some years back, it was a struggle to penetrate into this country and be able uh, to conversate with the other side of uh, the memories that we, we carry. So what I do is in relation to the Maji Maji resistance. And this is one among more than 50 resistances that the Germans faced between the 1880s to 1910, before the outbreak of uh, the First World War. And so the Maji Maji was like the climax. It was like the end, one of the last ones that occurred, and the largest one in that, in that case, as it united um, more than 20 ethnic groups and involved about seven regions of southern Tanzania. And so the Maji Maji is a traumatic event. And it is remembered not in Tanzania, but even beyond Tanzania. It is actually used as a case study for many centers for African studies all over the world. But when we bring it home, when we take this home, and bring it closely to the people who participated, who their forefathers participated in the war, the memories of uh, colonial resistances are still live and traumatic as it has already been elaborated. And this is brought out into the monuments, the memorial monuments that are built but also that are still standing. And here I mean spaces like prisons, bombers, police. All these bring out traumatic memories because they are regarded as the final resting places of the people who were arrested during colonialism. And to that, commemorations are conducted for now, we have commemorations in two spaces. We have a commemoration in Songea, and we also have a commemoration in Nandete, where the war started, because the war started on a cotton plantation. And so there, there is also a commemoration ceremony. And the commemoration ceremony is for the lack of a better terminology, because it is not really a commemoration. Because when you say a commemoration, it has an aspect of celebrating. To them, especially because of the absence of the human remains, this is a mourning ceremony. It is, it is like a repeat of a burial, because uh, the, the mourning is still ongoing. It has never been put to rest. So these are commemorations, but for the lack of a better terminology to, to name them. And the memories of the Maji Maji resistances are of different levels. There are those memories that are close to families. There are memories that are involving a small group, but there are also national memory. Now, we see that a lot of distortion happens at the national state because these have a tendency of appropriation of the past, taking what they want and leaving behind what they don't want. It is at this level that forgetting happens. And this is not accidental forgetting, but intentional forgetting. It is at this level that we see spaces for women 
and other minors in the, partici in the participation of the resistances are only left in the hands of families. And here we refer to someone like uh, Mkomanile, who had the same status as chief or sub-chief Songe Ambano. But her memories are not that much known, even within the Tanzania context. There is also an era that has crept in because of uh, this uh, uh, forgetting. So for instance, as the case of Songea, whose remains have not been found, Mkomanile's remains are also not known where they are. But her name is inscribed on the mass grave as amongst those who were executed in uh, the summary executions of the Ngoni in 1906. So all these are part of the national history. And it is at this level where all this distortion occurs. But when we take this to family level, these memories are still alive. And with this, we thank, we thank the institution of local memories. Because it is only in 1967, in Mwanza, whereby a, a statement was issued so that a, memorials should be built to remember those who died during the Maji Maji resistance. And you will see that is a long time since 1904, 1908. And then the memorials are built in the 1970s. A lot of time has passed in that uh, time. And so to build these memorials depended on the institution of local memories and descendants who still remembered this up to today. So this is where the memorials were built, but still empty spaces are remembered as important. So areas that have no memorials, have no uh, any structure, any formal structure, are still traumatic as if something is built there. And the trauma is actually inflicted by the actions that took place at that particular area. And so names have been given to empty spaces, execution trees or site of sermons. There are a lot of nicknames that have been baptized into hills, mountains, and empty landscape as markers and reminders of the memories of the German a colonialism in Tanzania, especially during the Maji Maji resistance. And so there are various groups who are also participants in the memory institution. So we have descendants, we have the government, and the government we have soldiers, we have museums, and we have government administrators, especially the administrators of the seven regions that were affected by the resistance. We also have the role of students because the Maji Maji resistance is one of the topics that is taught in schools. So much as it's taught for the cause and effect part of it, but it is taught in schools. And you can see that there is a conflict when these narratives are narrated at home and then they are superficially included in schools. So you find that the students are mixing up what they learn at home and what they get from textbook and from schools. But we also have the contribution of religion because the Maji Maji resistance affected sites that were of religious influence especially when it was regarded as a jihad. So it was thought as a process of the Germans Christianization of the southern part of Tanzania. And so most of the churches were burnt. And 
Missionaries were also killed. In these sites that missionaries were killed, memorials have been installed. And when it comes to memorialization, these sites are considered as pilgrimage sites, but they are also considered as heroic sites. So for the Christians, these are pilgrimage sites. They visit these sites for mass, for considering these as saints. But for the people, these are actually testimonials to some of the victories of the war. So there are a contestation of memories when it comes to, to these sites. But we also have representatives of the community. This is another dimension that is a contested part of the memorialization of the Majimaji resistance. Because in 1964, all the roles of the chiefs in Tanzania were abandoned. So th there is an abolishment act when it comes to, to the involvement of the chiefs. But these are actually the key players when it comes to memorialization. And they are close to these memories and they are people more than the government. Occasionally, the German embassy in Tanzania also take part in these commemorations. For example, the uh, National Museum in Tanzania was funded partly by the National Museum, the Maji Maji Memorial Museum, was partly funded by uh, the German uh, federal government through its embassy in Tanzania. The installation of the memorial in Nandete was also funded through the same channel. So occasionally, they take part in commemorations of the Maji Maji resistance. Now this, they, they are not obliged to, but they participate in it when they feel like doing it. And it is from that part that they receive actually demands from the community. And these demands are about restitution, but also demand for reparation. What they do with that information, I think it is something that we need to talk about. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Nancy, um, for a very insightful... Um, A quick, a quick follow-up question, though. Um, you mentioned different agents in the memorization and commemoration within the, the, the context of colonialism. Will you tell us what is the relationship between the official or state narratives vis-a-vis -vis the colonial memories of communities and descendants in Tanzania? Just a quick one. Yes, so the official narrative is what is represented as the Maji Maji resistance was a struggle for independence. In fact, the evolution of the army, for example, the history of the army, Tanzania People Defense Force, is traced from the Maji Maji resistance. So when you look at their history, they say the army started during that time. So it has been nationalized as a national event as something that happened in Tanzania and affected the South, but in general, it has influence to the entire, entire country. And so it is at this level that the Maji Maji resistance was mandated to be taught in schools at the national level, because before that inclusion after independence, the Maji Maji was not taught in schools. And actually teaching it was a punishable event. It was a punishable offense, rather. So it is after independence that we see this inclusion and this necessitation. And this is done by the state. But at the, at the family level, it is where the memories are found the down memories, the memories that are not censored, because there is censoring when it comes to the national level, the national memories. And that's where I represent um, Komanile, for example, that she is remembered at uh, the family or descendant level, but at the national level, her inclusion came very late, actually after the 100 year celebration of the Maji Maji um, resistance. So the, the centenary is when 
the um, Komanile was brought in. And Komanile is just one example. Other numerous women who participated in the war are also not known exactly, and their participation eluded. So it is at the uh, local level that these memories are well elaborated and even uh, more traumatic because when this is taught in school, it's taught as something of the past. But when you go to the families who were affected by the resistance, you understand that this is actually something that they live with it. They encounter it. These roads that they passed during the resistance are the roads that they pass when they are going to fetch water or doing their own cultivation. The grandson, for example, of Sikwaku Mbonde is farming on exactly the same farm that caused the Maji Maji resistance. For that, the family actually had to hide the grave of, Songe, of uh, Sikwaku Mbonde so that the uh, 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 fearing that the Germans can exhume the remains and take it away with the others that are nowhere to be found. So these are the traumas that people are living with at the lower level. But at the national level, this is not a story that we hear. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Nancy. Um, thank you. Thank you so much um, for a very insightful um, discussion that you gave us. Uh, Bernard, uh, you are an expert in the, in the, in the history of uh, colonialism in Dar es Salaam, and you interact with it almost on, on, on a daily basis when you, you tour people around. Will you share with us, what, what, what does it take for you to work at um, uh, Dutch in Dar es Salaam? What cooperations is there with German organizations? Well, I mean, one of the best, I mean, one of the frequent questions that we get asked the most to almost every day is like, why do you guys remember the German colonial period rather than any other colonial time? And I think something that we, most of us don't know, um, to better understand this, I think it's better to somehow um, learn a little bit about the history of Tanzania and maybe a little bit of uh, East Africa. The coast of East Africa have been in a different civilization. I mean, uh, we have been in contact with different people from all over the world, I would say, from around 2 century before Christ all the way to 4th century. This period would refer as a greco roman period or Greek and Roman period. And we have a lot of archaeological evidences, including the recent one, uh, Vespasian coins that have been found in Dar es Salaam like a year and a half ago. Then we have the so-called Indian and Chinese period, starting from 4th century all the way to 8th century. We also have a bunch of archaeological evidences, including uh, ceramic bowls and archaeological beads. And then from around 8th century, we have the so-called the Arab and Persian period until around 12th uh, to 15th century. And in 15th century, that's when um, the Portuguese <laughs> trying to find a route to India. If you're to, I'm just trying to summarize everything. And then um, after the Portuguese, <laughs> from around uh, until, um, I would say, uh, 1620s until around uh, 1699, uh, when the Sultan of Oman started supporting Arabs and Persians to fight against the Portuguese. So the Sultan of Oman occupied the East African coast from 1699 until around early 1860s. So around 1860s, uh, Sultan by that time uh, moved the, from Zanzibar to Dar es Salaam and established the city of Dar es Salaam. So in this context, I'll give most of my examples based on Dar es Salaam, but I would give so many examples in different other places at the coast of Dar es Salaam. And they established the city of Dar es Salaam. And unfortunately, he died around 16, uh, I mean, 1870s. And a few years later, the Berlin Conference, and after the Berlin Conference, the whole East Africa, I mean, the current Tanzania, Rwanda, and Burundi fell under the Germans. So the German colonial rule started around um, 1885 on August 25. Um, and that was the beginning of all the trauma and distortion, if I would say so. And um, why do I say so? It's just because um, every day when you go to the streets, I'll give Dar es Salaam again as examples. Um, everything that you see is connected to the history of German colonial period, starting from the buildings on the waterfront. I mean, all the Gothic and neo-Gothic buildings. I mean, all the street names, all the open spaces, so there is nothing you cannot talk and not uh, connect it to the German colonial period. 
So um, it's something that we do and we work on a daily basis. And um, back in 2014, some of the buildings that had already started being demolished, and we had an idea of preserving some of the or some of these buildings. And we started uh, applying for different funds, for example, from um, European Union. Uh, we had several funds to renovate some of the buildings, including one of our office, which is Old Boma. And um, since then, we have seen a number of people trying to uh, gain interest in learning about German colonial uh, buildings. Yes. Yep. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Bernard. Uh, initially, you said you people normally ask whether people you just were visiting Dar es Salaam and do you help them to walk around to visit those memorial sites and they tend to ask why you guys do you keep on remembering the German colonialism uh, could you share more experiences with Tanzanians um, how do they feel how do you feel when you uh, try to walk them through this path well I mean um Yes, so it's not something that is easy, to be honest. Um, I've done uh, guided tours with Tanzanians, and I get so many questions, because almost everything you touch will bring you back to the German colonial period. Um, to start with, for example, um, for example, uh, I would say displacement of people, for example. Um, and I would need a little bit of help from a technician there with a picture number one, for example. Um, yes, so. Um, this is the first master plan of Dar es Salaam city, which is one of the biggest cities in Tanzania. And this was the first master plan by August Liu. August Liu was also a friend and agent from the uh, German East Africa Korea, I mean, company. And he came together with uh, Carl Peters, and they all arrived on the same day. And because he was an architect by profession, so he designed the first master plan of Dar es Salaam. And until today, even if you have, you can Google, you can see, all these parties, they're still the same. We still use the same master plan. For example, this master plan was based on the segregation and uh, lateral division. Um, the waterfront here was special area for the Europeans. And then this part here was special area for the Indians. And then we have this open space, until today still open space. And then we have this area here, which you call the Kalia core, the third zone. So until to this date, all the streets are street still the same. I mean, the master plan of the three <laughs> neighborhoods is still the same. The open space is still there. And every, every day I get questions, why do we have this open space? Why was it there? So these are the kind of the things that I'm dealing every now and then. Maybe you can have another question, I mean, another picture. Um, for example, for the case of the street. Uh, one of the tours that I offer is what we call the street names tour. And here we trace different street and the evolution of street names. I mean, this is small, I a mean, small picture, but we have so many other um, street names. And one of my favorite street is what we call the, today we call it Makunganya Street, but it used to be the Wisman Street. And <laughs> Makunganya is one of the chiefs that fought against the, uh, the German uh, during the colonial period. And so, Almost every street you touch, it brings you back to the German colonial period because all these streets were established during the, the German colonial period. But to better understand why, for example, we had divisions, for example, of uh, leisure divisions, for example, I have a small note which I took from, um, from uh, I mean, our collection. We have like an archive, and um, it's a note uh, from um, uh, one of the soldiers, a German soldier, and he was dis just describing about. Um, uh, a little bit of Tanzania. Maybe you can read it loud so that people can understand a little bit. Yeah. Be aware of. Be aware of closing. Oh, is it closer? Close. close proximity to native quarters, especially at night. We have the figure one that just shows right. For this reason, in all well laid out stations in tropical Africa. The native quarters are separated from those of the Europeans. The native is a pathological museum. Ooh. His blood harbors malaria parasites. What's that? Filario, fil uh, filario worms, and it may be the germs of sleeping sickness. Many sorts 
of worms infect his, his bowel. On his person, lies and flies are frequent guests. The floor of his quarters is apt to be infected with diseases. Germ, diseases, disease germs. Keep him at a distance. For this reason, the white man is so far camped far from a native village than near it. The immediate vicinity of the village should always be avoided. Other precautions are... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. So this is a kind of history that we're dealing every day, every day. So because like everything that you touch, maybe you can go number four. So, <laughs> um, so the biggest problem or the biggest challenge that we get is like almost everything you touch will bring you back to the German colonial period. For example, this is um, uh, the population statistic. Um, as you can see, they had to count people from different uh, lays. I would say we had the food call the. Africans, Asians, Europeans, and others. But at the same time, we stopped this in 1960s after we got the first uh, we got independence. The first presidents used to say that uh, we don't have different lace; we have one lace, and that's human lace. And that's why we stopped this. But I mean, maybe you can go another another picture um, from yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to tell you this because when you look at the number of Europeans, uh, you can tell that it was a very small number, but majority of them were men. So when it comes, for example, to the case of buildings, like everything you touch have history to tell. Um, for example, this building, this is what we call the Dalai Salaam Club or the, um, the Deutsche Club. I mean, this was built as a home in 1903 by another German architect who was known as Freddy Gould. And, and the colonial government bought it and turned it into um, a nightclub for high lengthy officers. Next to it, there was, I mean, there is a lot of pictures, but I mean, I can show you some. So there was uh, a casino next to it. There was also another uh, nightclub for low-length officers. And these are the buildings that are still standing on the waterfront today, Dar es Salaam. So every day when we walk there, this is history that you have to tell people. And um, we had a huge discussion back in 1961. Uh, the first president wanted to demolish all the German colonial buildings. Why? It was just because of the history behind these buildings. For example, this building, uh, it's actually believed that uh, female Africans were, take, I mean, were taken outside naked as strippers every day and night, just as a refreshment for the uh, European uh, soldiers who were going to these nightclubs. So this is a kind of the history that you can take. But maybe the next picture. Thank you. Uh, yeah. think we'll come back to that uh, uh, for next time. Thank you so much, uh, Bernard, um, for a very, uh, very insightful discussions and a lot a lot of things to discuss and and and, and think about it uh, dr vicencia Schule, you have heard um, dr nancy and and, and bernard um, elaborating all these memorials and memories in in tanzania and you are an artist um a good one so to speak <laughs> yeah a, a feminist too and i saw when 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 when, when bernard was mentioning about they are all men, I saw you <laughs> nagging a little bit. Could you share with us how is German colonialism remembered and dealt artistically in Tanzania? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Valens. Um, we have to take into consideration that the German colonial stories are full of violence, cruelty, and all other negative things which happened during that time, uh, particularly the execution. So normally as artists who are coming from those communities, we are raised up to understand the brutality of the German colonial stories. So <clears throat> for example, when we were invited as artists to look at the 100 years of Maji Maji, we were facing a lot of challenges on how to present those hundred years before. So, and we zero into two, uh, 1905 to 1907 on the Maji Maji resistances. And when we were, tell, we were receiving the stories, there was a huge gap which existed 
And as Nancy said in, a, in our school education curriculum, there we inherited those gaps whereby some information has been censored or eliminated, particularly the stories of women. So we remember German colonial history and other stories because of his stories, which always have lacked her stories. So normally when we are looking back, we have been tasked ourselves to look for her stories. And as you are aware, when we are talking about violence in any war zones, women are the most violated individuals. And normally we don't take into consideration the rape, abductions, and abuse which were happening during the wars. Uh, German occupation in Tanzania, in current Tanzania, and the context of Tanganyika. So for us is to bring out most of the stories which normally are not, or people are not comfortable to listen to. And I can remember we had a huge discussion when we were availed with the research findings of the existence of Ndunanko Manile, uh, who was also hanged in, in a group of 67 leaders. And in, in February 1906, I guess, and we wanted to know if we can enact the process of hanging and all the brutality which resulted into death, into their death. And it was very traumatic for us as artists because we started drawing the visuals, imaginating, and perhaps I would pose this question. We normally say they were hanged, but nobody has been discussing how the heads were preserved to be shipped to Germany. And we wanted to enact the fact that they were boiled as preservation so that they can be shipped to Germany. And when we reached that stage that people had the capacity to boil human beings' heads is when we normally censor our ourselves because it also affects us as artists, because we are going on the performance with the trauma as well. So, and this is important to understand that the brutality was beyond what we are reading in literatures. And because we are trained from the colonial perspective, we are also trained not to accept, not to remember, not to talk about in details. And this is what we have also inherited. As uh, Ben was saying, we are inheriting a lot from the Ger Ger German colonial rule, which is also affecting us as artists in the current situation we are operating. We have some laws and regulations which are censoring us, for example, from showing the brutality, like rape, explaining the, um, all these things which happened, they will be censored. So we are going through the process of fighting every day to change the colonial rules and regulations we have in the art sector. So our process of remembering the German colonial history is what we are living today in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Schule. Uh, perhaps a, a, quick, a quick question of follow-up again now on, on the question of trauma. You mentioned briefly uh, as an artist and as a group when you try to enact, uh, to reenact what happened, sometimes you are felt with you go into the stage with the trauma and everything. Uh, could you uh, paint a picture to the, uh, the people 
the communities in Tanzanians and 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 and, 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 your, and your followers in the in the artist in the, in the artist. Do you think they follow the same trauma? Do you think they can read the, the same trauma through the through, through the work that you are doing? Yes, to a larger extent, yes. And what we are facing is the audience um, trying to, to question whether it really happened because it is extreme violence. It is extreme torture. And it's easy to write it than to act it. So for the, our audience, because also we go through uh, experiences, for example, in the performance we did about Ndunanko Manile uh, on her story, on the first draft, we had the scene where it shows the relationship between Nkomanile and a man when she is she, re she delivered the news of water. And because the information was conveyed at the bed scene when they were having sex, so we had a lot of challenge to, to explain why should we keep that scene. Um, we had so many discussion on that, but also we had a scene where Komanile was hanged. We had to also uh, to just cut it because it was. It seems to the audience which we had shown the pre-shows to become very traumatic. So sometimes we have to also adjust to our audience so that we can be able to deliver our message in a simple and not traumatic way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Nancy, I, let me get back to you. Uh, we talked about different actors that are involved in the memorization and, and, and commemoration of um, colonialism in Tanzania. Uh, what role do you think the involvement of, of, of African actors in colonial oppression, such as Askaris, Askaris' participation of indigenous communities in German military actions play in Tanzania today, in all Tanzania memories? I, I have a clip, I think, oh, okay. to, to, to show some of the, of the, of the players. That, those are the current players, and partly they try to imitate the roles uh, that were played before. Yeah, so these were, uh, this is the role that the, 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 the Ascaris are playing now. But it is something that we, we need more, more information about because there are agents of a colonialism who were 
in Tanzania as collaborators, as the collaborators to the German government, to the German colonial government. So Askari, Akida, these are identities that we identify with collaborators of the German colonialism. Now, we know these were hated as much as the Germans because the laws were passed through them. And for them, their role was to implement what the Germans were uh, saying. And so they had a more confrontation with the local people than even the German administrators directly. So that was the role that was played by them. Now, today, because they were equally affected, at the end, they were equally affected by the, the German uh, executions and killings and all other suffering. Because at the, at the utmost, the Germans treated their uh, agents and the local people equally. So some of them were killed by people. For example, during the Maji Maji resistance, Akida Muidawe was killed. There is also Akida Saif bin Amri who, who ran away because of the Maji Maji resistance. And these were the people who were close to where the, the resistance broke out. So at the end of the day, these people were equally affected by the war. And so we find that Akidas, that identity of the Akida is now a confusing one because the descendants are equally seeking for the return of their uh, remains. They are equally seeking for justice. So when it comes to the memories of uh, the descendants or the memories of the victims of the German colonialism, at this time, we are not, we are not uh, putting any hierarchies or saying these were the direct victim and these were not the direct victims. So there is also need for information, for more information about these agentive roles, especially when it comes to the title, for example, of the Akida, because further in the interior where Swahili was not spoken, Akida translated to chief because of the power that the Akida was given. So some chiefs ended up calling themselves Akida, or assistants to the chiefs called themselves Akida. So we still need a, more information because oral narratives alone cannot uh, prove that. So we still need more information to elaborate different roles that the Askaris and the Akida in that matter uh, played in the process of colonization and so the memories of them. Thank you. Um, you also referred to demands from different groups. And now we are talking about memories. How do you, um, in what ways are memories of German colonial, colonial violences in Tanzania linked to the demands of restitution, apology, compensation, and reparations from German? The question of uh, restitution, reparation, repatriation is entangled. There is no single community that is talking about repatriation alone. If I say that they are talking about repatriation and not apology or reparation, I'll be lying. Thing is, every community has its own demands because for them repatriation reparation restitution has different different meaning and so it is in the community that think of what is important to them and in what forms these restitution repatriation and reparation should take there are communities that think repatriation and reparation should go hand in hand. There are those communities that have been seeking for the returns of the human remains. For example, the family of Songe Ambano, the grandfather you see who was doing the rituals there is dead. 
So I filmed this while he was alive, but now he's dead. And his demand in every commemoration was the return of Songea Mbano's car. So in that family, they will not talk about reparation. They will talk about repatriation. Because for them, it is an urgent need. But this cannot be summed out as the rest, because 67 is actually a minor number. The people who were buried there were buried in three consecutive, in three different dates. And we assume that the people who were buried there were more than 100. And so the needs of the family of Songe Ambano are not the needs of the family of Zimanimoto, for example. So these are demands that are there. And reparation, repatriation, apology, these are the things that the people talk about. So there is no exclusion of the other. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Nance. Uh, Bernard, if we come back to you again uh, with your good Dar es Salaam. Why do you think societies in Dar es Salaam and even in Tanzania as a whole should preserve the colonial memories and buildings in Tanzania? Well, I mean, we don't only deal with buildings. We deal also with open spaces, monuments, and many other things. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, one of the questions that came when we were establishing Dutch as an organization to deal with uh, colonial architectural heritage was, why do we do this? But then we were like, OK, when you look around, most of our things to prove about the colonial period are not there anymore. And the buildings are probably the only main thing that can prove about the German colonial building and administration. So for us, there is no way we can face the future without knowing the past. And how do we know the past if we don't have the evidence of the past? We have buildings, and that's when we took the law of preserving uh, renovation and conserve all these buildings. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Schule, um, what would you like to see from the German actors about future cooperation in coming to terms with the intertwining German-Tanzanian history? I think the first thing is to also take into consideration, most of the time, we need to, OK. We are an oral society. And normally, when we get into the discussions about uh, colonial stories, we end up picking kind of vocabularies which also are not putting us at the position to demand more. And this is also things which have to discuss. Because norm normally, people will refer things as artifacts. And they, are, they were not artifacts. Those were resources. Those are stuff people were using. They were properties. So if we refer them as artifacts, it means we are trying to narrow down the whole conversation of restitution, reparation, to artistic works, which I think that's something we need to think beyond that. And also, when we are talking about the power relations, we, we need also to to put the names, we should study more, because most of the time when we see these heritage resources, they carry the names of what they are called collectors, which sometimes they say they are trying to change it to suppliers. But I think these people are not supply. You can't supply human body. You can't, there are things which we, so in this kind of negotiation, we need also to discuss the context of negotiation. The, the financing part is something which also we need to, to look at critically. Is Germany funding or paying back or cooling the situation? What is the essence? What is the interest of the German funding when it comes to its colonial past? because it doesn't match with our government when they go to negotiation. So these are broad discussions which we have to do. And thirdly, is about how we want to manage this conversation and the results. If you look 
in Tanzania, for example, the issue of restitution, reparation, repatriation is considered as an academic issue. So it's mainly at the University of Dar es Salaam, government arm of suppressing alternative voices, the University of Dar es Salaam, the current one. It is at the National Museum, a government arm of not allowing alternative ways of looking at things. And this is what we are being told the German government is negotiating with. So where are the communities? Communities are taken as rubber stamps. The survivors and the victims of the war are being used not only to their advantage, but to protect what is called the, the Tanzanian image foreign policy, etc. So the instrumentalization of the victim is a serious issue which we really need to put into the table. Do we really want to sort, or does the German government, for example, the researchers, the museums, want to sort out the, the, the challenges or the issues or the crime of the war or they just want to silence it because internally in Germany, there's a movement for that. So these are things we really need to negotiate because for me, it's, it's beyond funding, it's beyond publication, it's beyond research because this thing has been there for over 100 years. Why now? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um... Dr. Schule, thank you, thank you so much. Um, now um, I come to you, Dr. Christine. Um, you have been in Tanzania. You have um, engaged with the youth and the contemporary Tanzanians when you follow up the Gulen movement, and you have published about a lot about the contemporary Tanzanians. And now you have listened to the uh, to the panelists here um, discussing on differences or overviews regarding German colonialism memories in Tanzania and in German. What are the differences and points of contact in post-colonial memories in Tanzania and German? You would, you would, you would find out from them. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the question. So um, I, I wouldn't say that my research gives any answer to that. <laughs> and I'm just um, starting my new research. Um, and uh, yeah, it's... Um, so what I would rather um, try to do in my comment, um, I was asked to prepare is to um, think how we could um, bring these different um, points or some of them together and also how to connect it to the German context. And um, I, was, I wanted to do that by, um, by thinking together with you about a poem by the writer and activist Sharon Dodua Oto. And um, the poem was written and performed in December 2022 in occasion of the renaming of two streets in Berlin's African Quarter after Rudolf and Emily Duala Mangabel and Cornelius Fredericks. And I know that some of you have been also there on that occasion. Um, and it's called Das Erinnern. I was relying on a translation to English, but I will then, but we don't, we only have it into the other direction, so I have to. Um, translated to you afterwards, I will read a part of it in German. An den Tagen, an denen ich am optimistischsten bin, weiß ich, es geschieht. Those days I am most optimistic. I know that this happens anyway, the remembrance, because we have people that wear history in their hair. We have uh, strands of hope uh, that uh, are fled in, so, and resistance uh, included in every single dread link. Um, some uh, show golden drink uh, symbols, uh, and uh, kids are uh, um, embellished with uh, those who came before. We sing uh, songs of freedom, and it happens anyway, those who want to see it or don't. Uh, um, on those days um, on which I am most optimistic, I know it happens anyway, um, remembering. Because they are people who carry the histories in the hair. Um, hope um, braided into each cornrow. Um, daily resistance um, entangled in each dreadlock. Some show golden and decra symbols on their ear or, on, or around their neck. Here, there are kids given names from those who came before them. Um, there 
um, um, songs of, of, of freedom are sung. It happens anyway, whether the others want to realize it or not. So in public discourses in Germany, but also in scholarship, you very often find um, this idea that compared to other colonial empires, um, colonialism was not that bad. And we know this discord, right, was relatively short due to the early loss of the colonies after World War I. And we often hear, hear the term colonial amnesia. We also heard it this morning um, in the short introduction. Um, so the active act also of forgetting the colonial past may it due to the absence of diasporic presence of formerly colonized people or um, what is also often been given as the reason is the dominant role of the um, national socialism and the Holocaust. So in her poem, Otto says, remembering happens anyway. And she highlights the acts of memory that persists within structures of colonial, uh, German colonial history and its afterlife in post-colonial times. Um, what I think is interesting, because also we talked about the different, um, yeah, the, the question of power, revol um, like within the question of um, memory, um, is that she really takes a stance against the singular dominant understanding of German culture memory. And she contrasts the lowercase, lowercase das erinnern, written with a small e, um, with the uppercase erinnern. So uppercase erinnern refers to how the narratives of German colonialism is shaped by the lack of an apology for colonial violence, by racisms that are part of everyday language, and euphemisms like explorers or protectorates that continue to disguise the violence of, col of colonialism. And it refers how all of this is actually embodied also in a certain cultural canon and certain traditions that rewrite das Erinnern with a big big E, and lowercase uh, inan, which is also the part that I read to you, refers to the hard task um, of intervening in these narratives. And I know we have some here um, in the audience that are doing this hard task of intervening. Um, it is embodied. It, ha it happens anyway, whether you want it or not. That's what she repeats throughout her poem. So she, Otto talks of memory as being carried by people in their histories, in their hair, on their skin. So she really highlights also the, the role of um, black and people of color in this um, process of, of memory um, and points to the plural acts of memory that persist in spite of hegemonic narratives, which hold on to the idea that German colonialism was limited and of its memory of, um, that have, of memory haven't been forgotten. Um, so what is also important, she performed this, um, this poem on this occasion of um, the renaming of streets. Um, so it was instead of a speech. Um, so the renaming, which is a result of a long fight and intervention in the German way of remembering, a, or better misremembering its colonial past in order to call for acts, recall acts of resistance um, in the former colonies. Um, so um, what I think is interesting, especially also in our context here of this panel is that um, she somehow tries to rewrite colonialism and the cultural memory thereof as a transnational, as a transculture and a global process. And I think that's also very much true with Gorna's work that we also have um, been, have been the whole introduction to this um, to this to this day to this two days uh, meeting we are having. And um, so coming to the presentations um, that we heard or the comments that we heard this morning, I was um, thinking how this perspective of memory as something transnational, transculture, and also multidirectional might be f something fruitful we can think with. And I think a second point um, that um, also um, was mentioned um, in all of your presentations, and also which maybe we can draw a line also to this voice, uh, this activist and writer's voice from the German context that we heard, is the question of power within the process of memorization. Um, Nancy, you mentioned um, the important uh, voice of, of women that um, are actively also silenced. Um, you, yeah, especially you talked about um, Mkumanilis um, case, but, um, um, but we also heard, and I think this is, um, this is very important, also the different levels, like the question of, um, of um, memory and families, the role of the nation state, then how this actually also, how does power figure out in these diverse spaces also. Um, so I think this is maybe something we could also um, 
discuss here. So as you see, I'm not giving you um, any of my expertise, but rather some incentives that maybe we can um, think about and discuss um, together. Um, yeah, maybe um, looking at the time, we have um, very few time for discussion. I leave it here. I would have some other points, but if nothing comes from the audience, which I strongly doubt, I would uh, give them. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Christina. Um, and with your note, I would want to open this discussion to the floor. Uh, I would like to have any question and a comment. Anyone, we can direct your question to any of the panel members or a general a comment. You are most welcome. Um, I, I may have one. I mean, uh, actually, I liked very strongly the last uh, reflections uh, also on power relations, etc. But my question rather goes probably to both Isencia uh, Schule and Nancy Rucho Horara uh, on more the artistic side of things. Um, I'm uh, just wondering, probably many people here know uh, a rather commercial film, not the documentary that we saw yesterday on the Namibian side of things. Uh, Measures of Man was quite um, yeah, something that triggered discussions here, not only, but also because, and that was very controversial, very explicit scenes of violence and brutality were also in that film. And that was commented. Still, I'm wondering whether something like that would be needed as well for Tanzania. I'm just wondering whether you would be in favor of that, maybe building on a novel like Afterlives, mentioning also the Askaris, I mean, uh, what would you expect? I mean, uh, um, would that be something that you would look forward to? A more commercial film, I would say, fictitious, with a solid historical background. Would that help in your situation? Thanks. Thank you, Andres. Uh, thank you so much. Um, from the Tanzanian uh, perspective, it might not be that possible because our film... Uh, regulations, colonial ones, um, putting the filmmakers at the corner of compromising their creativity with the government policies. So our film board, I have to declare, I've been a member of the film board <laughs> for 10 years, 2011 to 2021. And what we tried our level best is to change the name from Tanzania Film Censorship Board to Tanzania Film Board. So that's the only thing we manage. And <laughs> the rest of the regulations are in line with what the ruling party or the president want to hear. So if the president or the ruling party and the government people are not comfortable with discussing the colonial stories and how it was, the brutality. It's difficult for a filmmaker from Tanzania. Maybe as a filmmaker as in the diaspora, it's possible, or having a co-production with other places. The opportunities are there. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe if I can add to what Vicencia said, uh, we, we really need this uh, platform and there is no one direction that reaches us to the end goal. So already we have seen novels, for example, Vunko Manile that are written. And we have a colleague here who is writing about another woman, uh, Liti. So this is something that we need. So we, we still have very few but it is an approach that can help because much as we talk about the resistance, but still it is not well known. So having it in different areas, in media, in books, novels, film and other platform will be important. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Yep, let's go. Is it on? No, yeah, okay. My name is Carola Lenz. Um, I'm very interested, Nancy, in what you said about the reinterpretation of history in order to make it into um, national memory uh, and the different levels and layers to do that at the community level, at the family level, or to do it at the nation state level. 
and I was intrigued by what you said about sort of redefining colonial collaborators into victims. Um, is it necessary to keep national unity by redefining history into a history of victimhood and resistance? I think that's not only a problem in Namibia, uh, sorry, in Namibia it's a similar problem. How do you go about incorporating those who collaborated with the South African um, army uh, into the national uh, community, into the nation state. And we even see that in Germany in, in all the places because uh, societies are never neatly divided and they are never neatly only resistors, etc., etc. So I'm very intrigued of which processes can help to maintain ambiguity and ambivalence. And I was thinking that probably artistic forms are a good way to do that. Rituals are more complicated. Monuments have to be more unambiguous. So I'm curious on further thoughts of you on that issue of how to render a complex, contradictory um, history of collaboration, etc. And I mean, even at the time of Maji Maji, nobody was thinking of building a nation state. Um, so even of reinterpreting that as a precursor to the modern nation is is already quite interesting. How, what are the ways to deal with these? Thank you. Oh, sorry. You want to respond? Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, 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 highlighting on that. It is something that actually I I agree with, that the homogeneity of it, making it uniform. I agree with it, and I agree with it because of the motives that caused that disparity, that differentiation. Because there are some chiefs who were coerced into collaboration. There are jumbes who were actually double, double agents. So at one side, they are with the community, and at another side, they are actually the tax collectors. So we have this double agentive role that was sometimes, sometimes forced or imposed into people. You will find that the same people were also the leaders of the resistance. So at this level, now putting hierarchies into their victimhood, I think it's, it's not going to be the right thing to do because of the motives, of the reasons behind their participation. And that's why I called for more information. So if we can have a backup of archival records that says this was that and that, because we don't have clarity when it comes to that. So the participation of one and not the other is not that clear. The community will mention someone who was the leader of the Maji Maji resistance at the same time in the German record as the main tax collector, as the Jumbe, as an Akida. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Daniel Morat. I'm with the German Historical Museum. I'm with the German Historical Museum. And I was, thank you very much for your very powerful accounts of the traumatic presence of, of German colonial rule in, in Tanzania today. And I, I wanted to ask you also about the, the tension between sort of the national and the local, the government imposed and the civil society memory narratives. Um, because the, and, and as, as I work for a museum, I'm especially interested in the role of museums. And um, in your case, or the way that you describe it, the museum is always on the part of the government. And I was just wondering whether there are museums also on the level of the civil society culture, if there are sort of smaller museums that work in a different direction than the national museum. Thank you. Yes, um, we have some more museums, and in Dallas Salaam, in general, for example, we have around eight museums that are not uh, part of the National Museum. Uh, one of them, I work in one of them, is known as uh, the Old Boma Museum, which is offices for Dallas Salaam Center for Architectural Heritage. And we have been collaborations with some of the German organizations, for example, TU Berlin, uh, since 2014, uh, Technical University of Berlin, um, they helped us during the innovation phase of the buildings, but also Goethe Institute and some few other uh, institutions. So all these um, help us in financing us to 
uh, go to different museums, learn a little bit more about the history of German colonial period. So yes, there is some of the museums that are not part of the National Museum. Yeah. Thank you. Should I want to add a little bit? I think the issue here is the independence on what you can do with the, when it comes to issues of reparation and restitution. Um, the freedom, I, I, I feel the freedom museums are having here in Germany to engage um, not in collaboration with government, maybe museum to museums, it need to be nurtured in Tanzania to have that legal capacity to get in kind of those uh, negotiation of lending uh, heritage resources at, at that level. So I think that is an area to nurture because normally in, when it comes to discussions, uh, many museums have not that capacity many German museum will have. It will be in, in the area of training, uh, skills development, knowledge, dispensation, but it doesn't really get to the post point where other countries' museums in Africa are having that we can have a bilateral museum agreement to have this kind of property, heritage properties lended for a certain time. So that is an area to work on and make sure that these museums, I'm not saying that we need to deconstruct the National Museum of Tanzania, but we need to give competitors to this museum so that we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yes, the, um, the ball is still in your corner. Thank you. Um, thank. Uh, yes, please. This. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Norel. I'm from the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt, and my question is for Dr. Mashimi. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about um, your research about how young people in Dar es Salaam are um, are dealing with the colonial history and what kind of memories you've come across and experiences you've come across in your research. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I have to say it was framed a little bit um, differently. I didn't research um, on the colonial memory of youth, my, but I did a lot of research in schools. So um, I did research mostly in Turkish schools, which are like more elite schools. Um, and and in, the, in, in Dar es Salaam, so in a very urban area. And I participated in civics um, classes for for more than a year. So this is maybe my field of expertise. And I think I cannot add uh, anything more than what you actually um, said. I think what is um, what what you we talked earlier about, and uh, you talked about um, the dominance of of men in these stories uh, of colonialism. I think this is something that might be something to follow up also in the civic books that you you get uh, in these kind of classes. Um, so there's maybe something, but I didn't really do research how the students talk among them about this or how this would contrast to what is being told in, um, in their families. I find this only also very interesting. So very sorry, I cannot give you a better answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Last question, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, maybe come back to, the, to, my, to my panelists. Um, one minute, Dr. Nancy, what will you share with us in terms of colonial memories in Tanzania? Just a minute. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that uh, uh, the vibrance of these memories and the, the fact that these memories are everywhere is something that is communicated and so there is a need not to listen only, but also to hear. Because this is the call that is, is made out. Because when these were happening, these people had no time, they had no one to listen to them or even to hear. Now these memories are played out 
it is very important to listen and to hear. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bernard? Um, what I would have to say is trauma is alive. And you can sense it every day. The moment you start tracing one thing, you open up the other thing. And for us, there is no way you can face the future without knowing the past. So I would love to ask any I mean, support from German civil institutions and other organizations that would love to help us in preserving the evidences that we have today in Tanzania. Thank you very much. Shule. Thank you. Uh, mine is uh, starting from the point normally we say shared colonial history. I'm so discontented on what we are sharing in that violence. So I think the terminologies we are using when we are getting to reading the colonial uh, stories should be, we should be a little bit sensitive and analytical especially for the researchers in here, who are the ones, the most people who coined these vocabularies. And two, we need to use technologies to transform the information which are written in books, in articles. Those are in archive, using technology and like visual real, uh, realization, etc., to bring this information to our people, particularly in our communities where we are orally based. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Christina? I think uh, Vicente should have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, please, a big round of applause to my people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before, before I ask them to now return the seats, but they have been asked to make a few announcements. We are going to have a quick um, health break. Um, and then we will uh, split into the uh, spotlights. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for registering. We know we have registered to different uh, spotlights. Um, spotlight one, nature and conversation, will be in the, uh, in the room that we are in here, in this room right here. And then Spotlight 2, uh, missionary work, will be, um, I think that's the room behind here. There's, there's a door, I think you can go through there. <laughs> uh, spotlight 3 will be in clean soil. I think just behind after the, the health table is, will, be, will be there. And we know that um, each one of you may have registered in one or two. Uh, one of the spotlights, but uh, I'm told this, this, this is free. You can switch the way you want. If you come to the missionary and say, okay, I, I, don't, I don't like missionary, <laughs> 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 then uh, the, the nature people will be there. <laughs> and then you walk there. If, uh, more, mm, then you go to spotlight three. And you can come back to missionary work again. So please, uh, once again, I really thank you very much. And um, I adjourn the table. Thank you.